to the Minimum Standards Working Group and Jen. Thanks, Jen. So good afternoon, everybody, and very warm welcome to the pre-launch for the minimum standards in camp management, which is your handbook, which is our handbook. Um, I am here today with Tom. Hello. Hello. And Bruce. Hello. Hello. Great, good. And um, we are really excited to, um, to be in this session with you. We've planned it um, with all of our field colleagues in mind. Um, it is not uh, so long ago since Tom was walking around in Sudan uh, the last few months, and it was um, not so long since Bruce was walking around in Bangladesh. So we really wanted to use this uh, session during the retreat to uh, spend time together uh, sharing with you some of the ways in which the minimum standards can be relevant back to operations. And we have an exciting session planned today. We're going to hear some examples from the way in which the field testing has been piloted. We have a very um, nice high level uh, speech for us, setting some pretty high goals and aspirations from our friend Philip, who is with UK Aid. We're also gonna hear from our friend Tristan Hale and our other um, sisters and brothers, Travis and Carrie from Cox Bazaar and the ways in which they have operationalized the standards but the most um, important part of our session today is to really um, plan the dissemination strategy. And that's going to be um, when we talk together as colleagues, it's going to be the first time that we will use group work today. So it's a nice way to start um, talking again. So thanks for coming. And um, here we go. So, Tom. Yes. How you been? <laughs> Good. I am full of cold, so if I'm, I, I will try mute for the for the periods of time where I'm coughing or sneezing. It is not COVID, um, <laughs> uh, but, but yes, um, I am back from uh, six months in Sudan, where, um, as many of you know, double hatting one as emergency coordinator for the Danish Refugee Council, but then secondly, also starting to fly the the. The, the, the minimum standards flag um, in Sudan with this this uh, with two new um, refugee camps that have opened due to the Tigray crisis um, and I know this is something that we've that we've talked uh, previously at on a CCCM Tuesday but um, I'm also very excited to kind of present on some of the the um, the activities and, and and some of the the ways that we are moving the standards forward. Yeah, I think we're looking at a picture of your camp that you were working in in Sudan um, right there on the screen, and I really envy you for getting a chance to travel. Uh, the last few months I've been stuck here. Um, we also had some kind of sad news the last. Um, the last period in that our, our really good friend of ours and a friend of the working group, you'll see him pictured here, um, Monir, was, um, it was announced that he, that he died uh, tragically and quite suddenly from complications with diabetes. And so I just wanted to take a minute at the start of our session because he was with us last year when we did this session. He was a really vital part of the working group. And I just wanna, um, to recognize how much we miss him and how much we know that there's a lot of um, colleagues right now who may be sick or may have to be dealing with um, some pretty heavy situations. Um, so I just want to say that at the beginning. No, absolutely. And um, I think many people who, who have worked in Bangladesh, I know many people on this call will have, um, will have known um, 
Munir, or have worked or at least heard him on some of this, the, some of the events that we've done, right? The CCCM Tuesdays, he was um, part of um, our standard session there. Um, so moving on, one of the things that we wanted to do today is to um, show what field offices have been doing um, or what has been done um, with the standards this year. And so we launched a call for budding Spielbergs or Tarantinos uh, <laughs> to, to put together um, some videos to show that how they'd use them in their, um, in, in, in their context. So we're, we're gonna see three uh, quite short videos um, which is not, uh, which, which is a selection. We had a lot of submissions, but we're going to hear from uh, Somalia in the ways that they've tried to integrate standards into their programming, uh, Bangladesh, um, where they've completed contextualization workshop and how they um, are using standards in women's participation projects. And finally, Mozambique, um, where we where they will talk a little bit about how they specifically used um, one of the standards, but I, I will leave it to them and hopefully this will work. We will uh, roll the video. Use the CCM standards by coordination and monitoring the safety in the site monitoring protection assistance framework in humanitarian standards through community governance and we also established a complaint mechanism so IDBs can raise their concerns and complaints. It makes a difference these standards help us than for the IDBs to raise their voices and have a platform they can raise their concerns and have a full participation in the ongoing activities and it help trust build a trust between the organizations and the ADBs. This is Travis Lyon, the Site Management and Site Development Sector Co-Lead in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. We've just recently completed a series of contextualization workshops to adapt the minimum standards for camp management to this response, which, like all others, is quite unique. It's hoped that adapting the standards to this context will help us better measure the overall quality of SMS, which is known as camp management by most of us, and to help us uh, work to advocate to address unmet standards and also to inform the base of a monitoring framework for the eventual handover of camp management to the government of Bangladesh. Hello from Cox's Buzzer. I am Flores Munmun Boyagi, working with IOM Site Management as a Senior Site Management Assistant in Capacity Building Team as WPP Focal. I have been working with IOM Site Management since 2017, right after the influx. It's a great opportunity for me to see the changes over the years in the camps. Before I was supporting camp manager in camp, working in three key pillars of site management, which is communication with communities, camp operation, and community engagement. Global standards ensure that the site management or CCM can advocate and strongly promote it to the camp leadership headed by government camp in charge, and then the community leaders, including imams, majis, who are mostly male-dominated. Site management agencies can use this as an advocacy tool at the same time as an accountability tool where an SMA will be guided from inception and designing of the project to ensure the meaningful participation of women, girls, and vulnerable groups are top priorities, not only in the operations at the field level, but also in the overall programming and the capacity development of actors. Hello, CCM teams around the world. I'm speaking from Marupa relocation sites in the district of Shiuri in the province of Cabo Delgado in Northern Mozambique. Due to insecurity issues, we're facing the displacement of nearly 700,000 people. Uh, we've identified over 50 sites in the region, and our team works daily to ensure standard 4.2, where services are coordinated to meet the needs of both displaced and host populations. We map all stakeholders, and we maintain open communication and coordination channels. We identify gaps in the service provision, and we look for relevant partners who can support the implementation of the sphere minimum standards. Quarterly, the team sits down and reflects on the implementation of the camp management standards, which helps us understand our points for improvement in the CCM response. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's only three um, examples, but I think all really, really good examples. And answering that question, was the standards going to become another document that was put on the shelf and, and, and not used? And, and 
despite the fact that it that we haven't even launched the standards that it's only in its field testing version we're already seeing um this great pickup of it um and and it's slowly becoming this very um core document to to, to what standards a very core document in cccm operations now question for you jen did we tell Juan about the standards well i i think yeah she kind of knows the development of standards for camp management has certainly been fundamental in facilitating many parts of the work that I do. As a global CCCM cluster coordinator, one of my key tasks and responsibilities is to raise awareness and share information about what camp management agency is and does and how it relates to other actors working to respond to a displacement crisis. The structure of the standards allow for easy adaptation from doing a five minutes overview of CCCM to having a more detailed discussions on specific components. The standards has certainly become one of our key tools for communication and advocacy for the sector. So I, I know that we've been doing some training, but actually I have not followed this very, very uh, closely as, as I was in. So Dan, so maybe Jennifer, if, if you could introduce um, the next section. Yeah, um, I hope Elena turns back on her video because um, she and I, hi. Um, we, we were approached kind of spontaneously by a small German NGO and my German is not good. So I'll just say it in English. Uh, the Workers Samaritan Federation who are working in Greece and part of the SMS sites for refugees and asylum seekers there. And they learned about the minimum standards through SPHERE and they approached us and they said, hey, we want training in this. And it wasn't part of our work plan to do training in the first few months. It was something we said, oh yeah, after we release the, the um, minimum standards, we'll do training. And they said, please, if you, um, if you would you know, not mind, uh, so Elena and Ben and Agnes, um, we kind of banded together and we've been doing training with them and they've sent us this video, which I think is really nice. And Elena hasn't seen it yet, so I'm, I'm excited to share it with you now. ASB teams practice coordination meetings with the community every month. So this tool helps maintain transparent communication and coordination channels with the hosted community but also with the national authorities and other actors present. ASB protection teams make sure on a daily basis that protection risks are minimized and that the response to a potential situation is immediate and to the best possible standard. The protection team's action is based on standard referral pathways, clear humanitarian policies with involvement of the health actor and site administration, but also other stakeholders if needed. Special attention is on SGBV, GBV, PSEA and child protection. Furthermore, ASB has developed its own child safeguarding and PSEA policies. ASB teams practice coordination meetings with the community every month. This tool helps maintain transparent communication and coordination channels with the hosted community, but also with the national authorities and the other present actors. These meetings help monitor the achievements, make new plans, identify new challenges and eventual gaps in the camps. Due to the closing of one site, today we're facilitating the transfer of 111 beneficiaries to three other sites. The beneficiaries were informed about the new destinations, the services and the time of the transfer. The ASB field team safely facilitated all the procedures in the handling of uh, personal belongings while emptying the rooms and made sure that children and all the residing populations were safe during this process. So, again, yeah, we've heard from NGOs um, and, 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 and IOM, uh, CCCM operations. We've heard about capacity building. We've heard from the global um, cluster. But what about governments? Have we heard? anything from governments? 
We actually have, Tom, and that was another surprise for us from the videos is that the government of the Philippines, and I think all of us can say that um, they are one of the few places that has suffered from, you know, just multiple natural disasters every single year. It seems as if there's a earthquake or a volcanic eruption or a typhoon or a super typhoon, and then there's the conflict in Mindanao. So they're constantly struggling with disaster response there. And so the last video is from Ms. Hillary, who shared with us um, how the government of the Philippines is looking forward to using the standards too. So if we can play that last video. Hi, I am Hillary Marie and Radioya, a social welfare officer of the Department of Social Welfare and Development of the Government of the Philippines. We view standards as the practical application of human rights. These help us to state actors and primary duty bearers in planning and preparing for disasters. It makes a difference because it ensures accountability and sets a consistent approach in our humanitarian action. Our constituents are also empowered to demand and count on us for quality assistance. Taking into consideration the context of where the response is taking place, it is still important for standards to be applied globally because it reflects the inalienable human rights which are applied universally. Right. I think what I love about that video is that it really gets to the essence of standards. It's not focusing on, on key actions or indicators. It's really about what camp managers do about upholding human rights. So I, I think it was a really beautiful video and such a nice surprise. So um, Tom, what's next for us? What's next? Right. We have over the last um, well, over the last few events, we've been trying to get different voices, uh, different opinions, um, different perspectives on the CCCM minimums, or, or on the camp management minimum standards. So we've heard from people such as Chris Gadd, Head of Emergencies with the Danish Refugee Council. We've heard from, um, uh, from, from, from camp managers in the field, if you remember from um, Iraq with camp closures, um, we've heard from other kind of groups that have this interest. And so what we would like to do today is introduce uh, Philip Deloy, who um, is, is talking on behalf of FCDO, formerly DFID. He is part of the HSOT team. Um, and, and so as normal, many acronyms, um, which, which hopefully he will pick apart. Um, but Phil will talk from uh, the perspective then of, of, of the donor, which is, or of a donor, which is something that we, we haven't touched on as much in, in, in past events, but hopefully um, he can bring some of those uh, perspectives today. So hopefully we can hand over uh, to Phil. Thanks so much, Tom. And, uh, and to Jen and all of you for having me today. Um, I wish I'd had these when I started out. Um, I can say that for myself, but I can also say that I heard it a lot when talking to people in preparation for today. And it really wouldn't surprise me if everyone in the humanitarian sector, regardless of the cluster they work in, will eventually say the same thing. Um, so just to put my cards on the table, I'm a relative outsider to camp management. I'm, I'm not a practitioner of it. Uh, I've worked alongside CCCM colleagues in lots of places. I've been in the sector for 12 years in, in a variety of roles, including in cluster coordination, um, number of continents. Um, so why did it take me so long to articulate what camp management is and should be? Uh, it, I mean, to me and, and to a, a lot of colleagues who aren't CM practitioners, I can say it seems almost like a kind of sorcery where only the initiated knew what was going on. Uh, I could identify some great practitioners uh, even before I understood what they were doing on the basis of the consistency of their good relations with affected populations. 
uh, I understood a little of what they did, or or at least the how. Uh, they were applying accountability to affected populations, protection principles, ensuring SPEAR was being met to the maximum extent. They were doing good information management. Um, but it took me a fair bit longer to understand the what of, of what they were doing. Um, these new standards have changed that. And I think they'll change that for everybody. Uh, they've helped me understand what camp managers and by extension CCCM cluster coordinators actually do. Uh, reading them has helped me to appreciate um, in far greater detail what has been a critical gap in my humanitarian education. While reading the standards, I sought to understand them better by speaking to practitioners, coordinators, and experts who are going to be using them. And they include a bunch of folks who are on this call. And I asked them a few questions. One, how will having a standard change things for your sector? Two, how did meal for camp management work without them? Um, and you know, to what extent are having minimum standards for camp management likely to change things? And the third key question I asked was, in a perfect world, the camp management standard and humanitarian response as a whole would be unnecessary. But assuming the rollout of these standards was perfect, what will camp management look like in five years? And what needs to happen for things to turn out that way? What do we need to do to get there? The new minimum standards help address something fundamental the issue of professionalization in our humanitarian sector. The standards don't exist in isolation. Part of their value stems from the strong links to the toolkit, the guiding principles on IDPs, and more recent works like the area-based approach paper and inclusion of out-of-camp approaches, to name just a few. Normally, I worry about the stratification of guidance and standards. You know, relatively few standards are replaced or consolidated compared to the number that are added. So, uh, so I'm normally opposed to the addition of new guidance without consolidating it. But having spoken with people like Rafael Abis, Der Hayo, Isabel Screen, Juan Sofan Panic, and others, not forgetting Jennifer and Tom, of course, I recognize that standards address a genuine and large gap in how to ensure better AAP, representation, and enabled governance, among other things. They make a huge contribution towards making aid fairer, more consistent, replicable, and measurable. They're also as clear and widely applicable as possible. So I just wanna pause for a moment to acknowledge there's a challenge with that last bit. Aid workers naturally wanna see good quality responses, but these are different from place to place from one to the next. And there's a risk in using the same approach everywhere. So the extent to which these standards enable contextualization in light of host authorities' views towards displaced people is really important. We want to ensure that host governments are capacitated through the standards to better discharge their responsibilities under UN General Assembly Resolution 4682 that's the one that says that states have the primary duty to respond to emergencies in their territory. But we need to balance that with our mandate and duty as humanitarians to see aid and protection um, provided effectively and impartially to affected populations. So the risk that I saw is that once a standard's created, it's out there for everyone to use. And, and what if it isn't applied reasonably? I got a little nervous about this, as I keep saying, and so I ended up speaking to Christine Knudsen. She's the former executive director of Sphere, and she kindly took the time to share from her experience that this is not a new problem. She shared that the universality of standards can be problematic for all sectors, shelter, health, nutrition. Anyone can take them up and use them. They can use them for advocacy, crisis preparedness, governments can use them, non-state actors, you know, non-state armed groups can use them when they're acting as local authorities, and it's unavoidable, for now at least. Standards at their worst are a double-edged sword. Ultimately, we accept this for all standards. We accept and acknowledge their use by all, but we also 
in having these standards now have a tool on which to evaluate how camp management is being delivered. We can now, thanks to the standards, assess, we can verify, and we can offer more targeted support. These minimum standards in camp management raise the bar for everyone. We'll then be, or now, be able to hold ourselves and others to account. So what do they do that I'm so excited about? Well, they're coming. Um, at a time and in a format with scope to raise awareness of what camp management is and ought to be, more than perhaps any other document previously. And I, I say that with the massive respect due to the contributors to the toolkit. They deal with how uh, camp management should be done, both in and out of camps. They drive accountability to affected populations in a whole new way. They're more akin to the humanitarian charter than some of the other technical chapters of this care, quote Raphael. I'm gonna quote him again. Um, they enable a more fulsome delivery of the rights-based approach. They're an expression of the rights of the individual. I think that's a particularly beautiful part of the guidance for our sector. They go way beyond just protection. I, I know we all have mixed views on the idea of what dignity is, and whether we've got the power or indeed the right to suggest that anyone can confer it on someone else. But I hope you won't mind my suggesting that this standard may help us to better define in a humanitarian context what that ought to mean. They step up participation, self-representation and governance by providing all of the key actions needing, needed for planning how to do this. So in practical terms, what can the minimum standards in camp management help practitioners with? The handbook can help with consistency and with handovers. It can and already has led to com increased community engagement. It can be used to advocate to host governments and to donors. The camp management standards could and should be used as a benchmark for proposals. They point out best practices and help identify what's being missed, even for experts. They enable better service mapping. They can be drawn into national strategies. Their design means they can be easily contextualized. And they can be drawn in or bridged with government standards. Although I'd suggest it may be important in due course to show which one is gonna take precedence in some cases. And that last action is key for localization of the standard. I can flip that to make a bigger point. The standards themselves help to enable localization of the humanitarian sector. They can, and I believe will, support LNGOs and indeed governments to act as camp management agencies. They can be used with national preparedness, early warning and contingency planning. And humanitarians can use it uh, for advocacy on, on all, of, all of those. Um, and that's thanks to a really thoughtful development process. Uh, it's been collaborative, it's been iterative, building step by step. I mean, you'll all know this better than I do, but the development process drew from a wide set of inputs. It went through pilot implementation, monitoring and validation before finalization. Consultations took place with over 850 people from all over the world, both face-to-face -face and online. Field consultations were held in Bangladesh, Iraq, Somalia, South Sudan and Turkey alongside video conferencing consultations from Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Panama, Peru, and Venezuela. These were essential in reflecting well the, the diversity and specificity needed in managing displacement sites. CCCM colleagues and PHAP have worked with a wide range of other actors to ensure solid attention has been placed on disability inclusion and linkages to other standards like child protection. And I'm sure that as new standards come online, like for inclusion of folks with diverse sexual orientation, gender identities and expressions and sexual characteristics, that specific guidance notes for them will be included too. The team deserves real praise for the process. And while I definitely mean Jen and Tom, I also mean the folks involved in their respective agencies, other cluster membership agencies, and those involved in the field test. I'd like to give credit to the SMS sector and Cox's Bazaar, IOM Mozambique, ASB Greece, national NGOs in Somalia, 
and the government of the Philippines. Doing so much of this remotely warrants some additional ways. But there's still a lot of work to be done. Dissemination of the standard will be a big job, even in the short term. It's going to require lots of materials translation. It's going to require lots of information sharing and training. It's going to take putting them in proposals from now. This will support uptake of the standards and eventually gains to the quality of funding. It's going to take a lot of monitoring, complete revision of meal handbooks and internal ind indicator guidance for NGOs. It's going to take considerable effort to start seeing it in HRPs. But humanitarian response plans are absolutely where I think we all want to see them. So I'd like to wrap up with my favorite thing about this standard. It looks at critical social and societal needs. It deals with some of the higher levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Most of the humanitarian sector deals with tier one, that's physiological needs. And thanks to the protection principles and do no harm, all of us deal with tier two, safety needs. But the camp management standard takes us further on the course towards enabling greater fulfillment in life for displaced people. Through concrete and measurable actions, it pushes us to enable affected people to be better recognized. And I can't overstate how important I think that is. I mentioned earlier that Raphael had very neatly described the, the standards as being more akin to the humanitarian charter than to some of the technical chapters of the sphere. This is where and how I'd like to see the standards in 2025. I wanna give credit once more to all those who have made these minimum standards for camp management what they are today, a massive push forward for the humanitarian sector on behalf of displaced people. So thanks to all involved and to you for your time and attention. Thanks very much, over from me. Um, thank you, Phil. I, I, um, I'm overwhelmed by what you said. Thank you. Um, but the thing that you said, which I think is so important, is that it's up to us, and they belong to all of us. These are not standards, as Tom has said, that were put on a shelf after we did the field pilot last year. Um, they've been used and now they need to, now that we're ready to launch, um, they need to be used. And you've put some big scary goals out there for us um, to be, I, I'm gonna uh, recap them. So uh, capacity building of governments, um, putting them into proposals, meal handbook revisions, internal indicators, HRPs, contextualization, uh, LGBTI plus rights, um, and in five years to to look at, at Sphere itself and to um, put our chapter in there beside the technical chapters, which is uh, some really exciting things to think about. And it's really the beginning. And I guess I want to say that um, we, we maybe need to look at Margaret, Margaret Mead and um, what she said was that never doubt that a small group of committed persons could, could change things. Uh, thoughtful, a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Um, I'm not sure that CCTM is wanting to change the world, but we are wanting to change the way in which humanitarian sectors, and particularly our humanitarian sector, is changed. And to do this, we're going to need to do it together. So what are the practical steps that we can take together to take our handbook and to cross this metaphorical bridge and to meet some of the goals that um, Phil has just laid out for us? Um, it was an undertaking to get them, but it will be more of an undertaking for us to use them. So what we'd like to do now is to put you into small groups. We're going to make small groups of around 10 people and we want some brainstorming. We want some ownership. The, the minimum standards were built on all of us sitting together and talking with each other about what we could do and how to shape the standards. And we need to do the same for our dissemination. 
And we don't need to do that through a Mentimeter poll. We need to do that through discussions and conversations and building upon the change agents that we as camp managers are. We solve things, we fix things, we're doers. So in small groups right now, we would like you to take on two of the scary things that Bill has just put out there for us. Um, talk about one or two of them, talk about capacity building, but then talk about HRPs or talk about the SPEAR handbook. And really in your group, just jot down ideas. We're gonna give you a Google sheet to be able to, um, to capture those ideas. And we'll come back in about 10 minutes and hear from you about what were the ideas that you talked about in, in your group. So Bruce, you're gonna suck us into small groups on the... Yep, it's happening. Is right it happening now? Now. Great. Okay, everyone Enjoy should- Enjoy your small group discussion. And I'm sending the link to the Google Doc um, to all groups, to all breakout rooms. Thanks. What a great session this is looking like. Uh, well done, Jen, Bruce, Tom, everyone, and Phil for that amazing talk. Just to let you know, when people are in groups, that message you sent with the link will only come up temporarily and it's difficult to copy and paste. So what you might need to do is actually go into the group and share it in the chat. Um, okay. So Bruce, if, you, if you've got the skills to do it, you might need to just send, uh, get the link to us, I guess, put it in the chat generally and then maybe send Tom, me, Jen into the different groups and we can share the link in there. Okay, I pasted it again in the chat. Okay. Um, so so there's... feel free to send me to any of the groups and I'll share it when I get there. Okay, um, do you wanna take, there's 12 groups. So do you wanna take one to three? Tom, you take four to six. Jen, you take seven to nine and then I'll do 10 to 12. Yeah. So what you can do is if you click on to Jen and Tom, if at the bottom of your screen, you've got breakout rooms, little box, you should be able to open that. Then you'll see the list of rooms, just click on the number in blue and it'll give you an option to join and you can just join that. Oh. I'm seven through nine, is that right? So it does look like, oh, Bruce has gone to one of the rooms, but it looks like they actually got the message from the initial message from Bruce anyway. So we might not need to go to the other rooms. Um, so we can, I'll try a second room, but we'll see. But I think, I think it looks like they've got it anyway. So I think it's okay. I mean, in some groups, I was also not that very connected happened to me. I was disconnected. Sorry, could you repeat that? He wasn't in a group, but I just put him in one. Oh, great. Thanks, Jim.
Uh, colleagues, can we assign? Because I see many colleagues here. First, they did not join the session, and I was in in one uh, in one group, and they were asking what exactly are they supposed to discuss. The group where Marco is. Um, they they should have received the Google Doc, um, which has everything that they need to discuss. I think, um, and for the people that are still waiting in in this plenary, they have to accept the uh, the invite to join the the breakout group. So if they're away from their computer, they won't be able to click it. Exactly. But how, where they can find the Google, the Google uh, Doc in the in the groups? Um, it can it was it was shared. Out, um, we can share it again in broadcast. Well, when I when I went to group one, here. when I went yeah. to group one, the the link that you initially shared, Bruce, everybody had. So I, I think they've got that. I think it's okay. Yeah. The problem, Jennifer, is that um the uh you need to edit the access so that anyone can edit it. At the moment, people can open it, but they can't type in on the Google Doc. So you need to change it so that anyone with link can be an editor. And can someone go to the group where Marco is, please, because they were waiting to understand a bit more. If someone can um, go there. Which group is Marco in? He's in room eight. Marco yes, and Veronica. Go. Yes. OK, yes. thank you. Thank you, Bruce. I've just changed the editing, so it should be possible now. Cool, well done. And so for the folk we still have here in the main room, um, which are lots of you. Yeah, so lots are of you with us? If you're with us, say hello, let us know you're here. If you're not with us and you're just checking your email, then join us because it's much more fun than checking your email. If you would like to be reassigned to one of the, okay, so from Pippa, can we re-add you to a group? So um, if we've got any of our hosts on, I don't think I'm, I don't, I think I'm only co-host Pippa, so I can't do that, but someone will I be able to. I can try to do that. Pippa, the other thing you might be able to do is at the bottom of your screen, you might see on the, the um, tab that says breakout rooms, you may be able to click on that and go into a room yourself. You may be able to select it yourself. If not, when Bruce gets back, we'll definitely be able to move you. Oh, Pippa's gone, that's good. Afra's left a message. I think only Yuan is Yes, side. Afra, there was a slight mistake with the, with the Google uh, Jamboard, uh, you should, or the Google Word doc, you should be able to add there now because it's been changed. So if you try again, Afra, you, you should get that now. I can see people typing on it now. exciting to see people writing on it in real time. I might switch off mute. I might pause the recording while we're all here because this is not going to benefit the session and then I'll start it again. It's Oh, good. Um, so we've been doing lots and lots of capacity building, um, but perhaps we need to be doing something a little bit different. A strong recognition of moving beyond the capitals. So getting out into where the action is actually happening and particularly in a natural, in places that have a recurrent natural disaster pattern, you know, it, the first responders, yeah, they're, they're out in the field now. So we need to take the training out there and Perhaps we need to be doing some different, moving beyond the traditional taking a training team to a remote place, bringing 50 people into a room and doing something. Um, look at different ways of engaging with people. We didn't get to anything terribly practical though. Um, and one, uh, so two other things then. One is um, it especially needs to be. Uh, given to local authorities, which I think was something that came up a bit earlier as well. And in order for that to happen, we have to move beyond translation to contextualization. And translation is important, obviously, but contextualization is equally important. 
And the last bit that was quite cool was um, building on things that are already happening is to partner up with other big actors who weren't present in our room anyway, might not be present in this room, not sure. So for example, with the Red Cross Red Crescent, uh, the, the, that's a big movement, getting them on board, making them part of the, the puzzle as well will give us outreach. Um, if anybody from that group would like to add, deny, feel free. Um, maybe just to have people start writing in the chat because that will help us with the note taking. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. And and I um, I really appreciate the idea about getting to kind of con contextualization. And indeed, we're going to hear about how. Um, Bangladesh has gotten into contextualization with a kind of step by step a little bit later on. So I think that that's that's 100% what we're thinking about too. But it's great to hear it kind of validated from your group. Cool. Um, I don't know if any of the other. I don't see anybody kind of raising their hands. So that means that I need to get my my Rolodex out. Kate, I see your name there. Uh, I hope you weren't in the same group as Kit. Can I call on you? Can we ask you um, what your group talked about? I hope, don't share anything about capacity building if you-, if you... <laughs> We didn't talk about anything to do with capacity building. Um, we spoke briefly due to some technical issues about two topics. Um, one, thinking a little bit about uh the proposal development um mm -hmm. and reflecting a little bit about the sensitization with donors but then also the possibility to promote them to the headquarters and sort of the grants writing teams particularly of ngos um given that often they are different sets of people um sort of in the same way that a, a grants person or hq person is very well aware of sphere it would be great to move towards them being also very well aware of camp management standards as a um, as someone who's been part of a lot of uh, NGO grants writing processes. If you don't include like a WASH sphere standard um, in your grant, someone from HQ is likely to come back and, and ask why. And it would be great to see sort of moving toward that for the camp management standards as well, um, which I don't know if that's been an angle that's been explored, but certainly could be a really good way of getting that reflected back to the field teams, not just from within CCCM, but from within their own organizations. Um, and then we also uh, had maybe a heavy weight of cluster coordinators in the call um, and spoke of very little. And I don't know whether Austin, you want to add to this about the possibility of including the standards in the sort of monitoring framework for partners um, at, a, uh, at a country level um, that the clusters do. Um, although from my perspective, that of course requires a lot of uh, a lot of proactive engagement and buy-in from from the partners. There's something that we'd be keen to do. Um, Austin, I don't know if you want to add to that. Otherwise, Jennifer, back to you. Thank you, Kate. I think what we uh, looked at and talked about was the fact that minimum standards give us the benchmark of the situation we should be there when we are serving the displaced people. So, so they do help us in setting the indicators and setting the monitoring frameworks to monitor towards the ideal. And they also do help us to set the questions on discussions on, uh, on assessments and, and any information and data generation work, of course, basically will be towards uh, meeting the needs that are required for the ideal situation as you serve the displaced people. So they are very important for information and evidence collection to in our work. Thank you. Thank you, Austin and Kate. Um, and I, I see that a couple of people have written in the chat and uh, our, our good friend Anjar of the Triple CM is, is um, encouraging us and we we really like I, I really appreciate the idea of kind of linking back together with sphere and indeed that was how the whole training came together with with asb was um their sphere trainer wanting to reinforce kind of the whole um foundation of 
the protection principles and the humanitarian charter and then building that into operationally strengthening the camp management section of their of their team's work. So I do think that there's a lot to be said there. We need to move on. And I know that we haven't given everybody a chance to talk, but we have Tristan standing by. And you know, one of the steps that we've taken is to apply to be part of the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. And we, we don't have the final word on that. I think we're gonna get it on Thursday of whether or not our application has been um, successful. But Tristan, maybe you can tell people who aren't as up to date with what the working group has been doing, what HSP is and um, share, a, share with the, the wider group here on, on the stage about what that, what that means and some of the advantages of it. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so uh, yeah, no, Phil spoke very eloquently earlier. In fact, I think we can just take his section and make a video and put it on YouTube and people will watch it. It was very engaging. Uh, he, what I took away from it was that Phil explained why standards are useful. And in fact, many would say indispensable. And he also mentioned that there are challenges um, around acceptance, around accessibility, around dissemination, around training, around uh, possible uh, criticisms of standards uh, based on misunderstandings about how they're supposed to be used. And these are all things that we, uh, we need to look at. But the good news is that you know, we are not alone as curators of standards in doing those things uh, because we have something called the Humanitarian Standards Partnership or the HSP for short. And what brings us together, I guess, is that we all share a common vision, which is that everybody has the right to life with dignity. And that's really what all this, that's what all these standards are about, right? Um, we also believe that by using humanitarian standards, humanitarian actors, very diverse humanitarian actors, including governments, including uh, community-based organizations, NGOs, Red Cross, everyone, um, by using standards, outcomes for people affected by crises are, are better. So the HSP comes together to make it easier for people to use standards, to disseminate those standards together, to address some of those challenges that there are to adoption and use of humanitarian standards. We also share um, what we call a common foundation, and I'm going to share my screen at this point uh, to just show you quickly what that is in a kind of visual way. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you see my screen, somebody. Yeah, good. So, um, so the Sphere Handbook actually has, uh, you can see it here as well, has eight chapters. The first one is what is Sphere? And then chapters two, three, and four are what we call the found, the principles and foundations or the foundation. Uh, but this is not just the foundation for the Sphere Handbook, which goes on to these four um, sets of technical standards in life-saving areas. Uh, this, the Humanitarian Charter and the Protection Principles and the Core Humanitarian Standard are also the foundation of all the members of the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. Sorry about my kids in the background. So now let's look at who are the current members of the, the HSP. So we have Sphere, Sphere. we have uh, Minimum Standards in Child Protection, we have Livestock Standards, we have Economic Recovery, we have Education, uh, we have Market Analysis, and we have what's known as the HIS, the HIS, the Humanitarian Inclusion Standards for Older People and People with Disabilities. Now, if you were here at the previous session, you heard uh, Wan and others talking about um, the fact that maybe one of the challenges for camp management is that it is cross-sectoral. Um, but again, your camp management is not alone in this group as being a cross-sectoral standard, right? So something like this HIS at the bottom and the MISMA, they're not really standalone documents. They don't uh, give you all the information you need to run your programs. They are complementary standards because they need to be taken sort of in the context and used alongside the other documents. So I'm very happy to say that camp management, I, you know, it's 99% sure we're still waiting for that confirmation as Jennifer said, that camp management will be accepted into the HSP, but it is a done deal. It will happen very soon. I'm also very happy to say that we will welcome the CHS Alliance uh, as an associate member. And if you know about the CHS Alliance, which I guess a lot of you do, 
um, then you'll know that that's really uh, great news to have them on board and just be part of this initiative. And I can also tell you that there are uh, probably logistic standards that are going to join. There are probably agriculture standards that are going to join. And we're in early stage uh, discussions with some people who are writing uh, DRR, Disaster Risk Recovery, and Environment Standards. Um, so we hope in within the next few years, this partnership can really grow. So there are currently four ways to access all these handbooks, uh, most of them, let's say. Uh, the first is to have uh, paper books. And people love these paper copies, right? But if you have lots of them, you don't want to be carrying all those into the field with you, right? Because that's already that's only four books and that's already two kilos, okay? So you can print, you can buy print copies of most of these books, but there are other ways as well. Uh, one of them is you can download PDF files, and if you can find this page on the Sphere website, you can get a link to all of the um, all of the PDFs here somewhere. Yeah, um, you can also download the HSP app, and so this is something which works on your phone. And I think what's something kind of unique about the mobile experience is that you can download the books onto your phone, and they stay there even if you don't have internet and you can search across the standards. And the final way, which I'll mention, is something called the Interactive Handbook. And if you are online, then I would say that the Interactive Handbook, which is what we're looking at here, is probably the best sort of richest interactive way that you can view the standards. So again, this gives you the possibility to um, search across the sets of standards. You can search across all handbooks or just choose the one you want. You can search particular chapters. You can just search for indicators if that's the kind of thing you want to do. You can very quickly pull out all the indicators across all sets of standards. Um, but you know, do be careful about taking indicators uh, out of the context of the standards that they exist in. But that could be interesting for that sort of getting into the HRPs eventually. Um, what we also have on here is the possibility for you to uh, view and submit user comments. This is called uh, the curse of the presenter. I have the computer thinking. How long should we give it? I wonder. Maybe not long Kristen, enough. Kristen, while it's thinking, it'd be really <laughs> useful if you could share that link, uh, the link you had on the, on the previous page where you showed where people could click. Yeah, that one. Perhaps just put that in the chat. That might be very helpful for some people um, if they haven't time. been to that website before. Um, so, okay, so you can add comments. Uh, so if you click on a section of text and you log into the system, you can, ah, here you go, you can add comments. So if I'm logged in, I can say, actually, I've done some research here and it's, um, you know, I'd like to draw attention to it. That will be submitted for proposal. It will be reviewed by our team. And then uh, if it's accepted, then it can go into the handbook, you know, next to the content which it's relevant to. So that is really the main way in which this version is interactive. Um, and the same technology we use elsewhere, and I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, yeah, so here you can access many different language versions of many different handbooks. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of the interactive handbook. But what I would say is that it is the kind of the tip of the iceberg. And I can't show you much of what's underneath, but I can show you a couple of little bits. Uh, one is that uh, we have usage statistics. So we know where people are who are using the interactive handbook. And we can see that in a good quarter, there are almost 20,000 uh, unique visitors to this platform accessing the standards, which is, which is great. Um, yeah, and I can also show you that we will have a new landing page quite soon. At the moment, if you visit the, the interactive handbook, you'll be taken into the Sphere handbook, but we'd like to give you a much uh, sort of better experience than that, where you can click into the, the handbook that you want and straight into the chapter that you want. And there's a bit of now HSP branding on here with this purple color, so it looks a lot better. This is just a test area. So I'm going to stop sharing. And just to sort of wrap up, really to talk about what else is under, under the water, which you've just seen the tip of this iceberg. And that's that what we have is uh, basically an end-to-end -end digital publishing platform. So if I give you an example of this book, this was created using Adobe InDesign. Uh, which is how most books are created, I believe. This book 
CPMS, the latest CPMS book, uh, InDesign wasn't used at all. This was actually typeset on the digital platform, which I've just showed you, but kind of the, the back end of that, because we have an end-to-end -end digital uh, publishing system. And the last thing you do is print a PDF and send it to the printers, and they send you back this nice glossy, glossy document. And within that, there's also, we use the user comment functionality for public consultations. So that's all, that's all pretty much ready to go. We have an indexing module because building indexes is actually something really complicated. And we have a really advanced tool for doing that. And we're going to soon have a, a navigation tool. So if you are a, a let's say, uh, an environment expert, you need to find out where all the information is related to environment uh, throughout the set of handbooks. We'll give you a kind of tool in order to help you find that information. So yeah, my final, my final thing is to say, it's, uh, it's really exciting that um, account management standards can join us. We already have a lot of technology, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of uh, sort of, um, you know, a group of dedicated people who uh, we're now going to work with camp management and sort of, uh, yeah, we're much stronger together trying to get into those places like the HRPs and, and all the rest of it. And the, the digital platforms, they're only a small part of it, but they are under constant development. And we look for, I look forward to making these platforms even more interesting with the inputs from from all of the members. So I'm very happy to take questions, but I'll pass back to Jennifer or Charlie to uh, perhaps take care of that part of it. Thanks, Tristan. I'm actually gonna pass back over to Tom. And I did see one little thing in your platform there that in the user, it said that there was like a camp book. Was that? Ah, uh, yeah, because this is, that was the test area we were looking at. So the camp book is in there already, yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, uh, move, moving on, we've, we're, <coughs> the next section, we'll look at something that has definitely been mentioned a few times uh, today, and, and certainly in the past, which is contextualization um, of the standards. And so, um, we, we should hopefully um, be joined by Kerry and Travis um, from the SMS sector in Bangladesh, who um, have led on a contextualization workshop um, in Bangladesh. So hopefully they are, they are here. Is, can Kerry or Travis, can you confirm? I can indeed confirm we're both here we're sitting across from each other uh, in the office here. Right now. Wonderful. Yes, you can um, hear me clearly. Yes, yeah, hopefully this, this will continue. So maybe to, to kind of kick things off, if, if you could um, sort of provide an, in, pr 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 provide an introduction to, to, to what you have done, um, and then maybe we can, we can sort of open it to um, question and answers. All right, excellent. So, so I guess I'll start quickly. I, I mean, I feel like probably 75% of the participants uh, here have worked in Top 6 Bazaar at some point. So I won't explain too much, but um, uh, to put it short, we're, we're currently working in what's commonly known as the largest refugee camp in the world. Um, um, it is a, a series of camps that hold Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. Um, there's been a long history of cross-border displacement here uh, of the Rohingya people. Who are minority from Myanmar. Uh, most recently, uh, the major displacements occurred in 2016 and 2016. As I said, there's over 880,000 um, refugees here. Uh, the response is fairly well-funded compared to um, others for CCCM, but does face a trend of uh, significantly decreased funding. Um, a pretty low possibility, unfortunately, given, given the current context um, in Myanmar. For, for short and medium term durable solutions, especially the favorite solution of the government here, uh, which would be to return people, or to, to get people to willingly return to Myanmar. Um, and of course, a, uh, a famously tenuous relationship between um, government camp administration um, and SMS, which is what we call um, CCCN here, site management support, a tenuous relationship sometimes between um, government stakeholders and SMS. Um, however, it is a strong, well-developed uh, CCCM response, 
uh, with events of national and international NGO partners uh, uh, from both the government and humanitarian side. I, I think it's fair to say that, that both sides play a very strong and critical role um, in providing assistance uh, refugees for this response. So in reference to the minimum standards here, um, the, aside from a patchwork of, of indicators in our service monitoring that directly relate to site management support. Um, there's no overall set response-wide indicators um, that allow us to specifically measure like key accomplishments and gaps of the overall uh, camp management response across our camps here, um, which is where we felt that the minimum standards came in um, to help us collaboratively meet us being um, members of all of the different SNS agencies, um, as well as what we call our area of responsibility agencies, um, which is a, a separate coordination structure uh, fairly unique to this response. But basically, um, the key humanitarian side stakeholders involved in camp management. Um, so we wanted to not only have a specific set of standards um, for camp management that measure that overall quality, but we wanted them to eventually, and this is still a work in progress, you know, to be sitting aside uh, sphere standards and other widely recognized uh, humanitarian standards that, that hold clout um, and are something that both donors and government partners can kind of respect um, to try to bring us closer to harmonization and the recognition that across different agencies we always have a little differences in programs and IEP activities, et cetera. Um, finally, I think a large part of the importance of, of us moving forward now with contextualizing the minimum standards um, to this response is because there is a response-wide agreement here to eventually, the timeline is not set in stone, but to eventually transition camp management entirely into the, the hands of the Bangladesh government um, through what's currently functioning as government camp administration, uh, known as camps and charges. So we're hoping that before this transition, again, that we'll be evaluating our quality to date, identifying gaps that we can push hard to advocate for and work on to improve them. Um, and that during the transition, they can kind of serve as a, a basis for a monitoring framework, a, a basis um, to try to help, help guide um, the government of Bangladesh to have a successful transition and, and successfully take over that and can eventually do. So the process to date um, I guess I'll start with the WHO. As I said, it's whose area of responsibility agencies, like the UNHCR and Ireland here, and then all of the, the SMS partner agencies. So that's um, six national and international NGOs. So this began um, with basically us tabling all of the global standard indicators, um, kind of putting our initial, initial notes as a sector, just things that were obvious disseminating these um, to the different agencies and compiling feedback and kind of having an ad hoc feedback loop over these things and discussions, you know, remotely uh, over the course of about two weeks uh, during this time. Um, not only programmatic focus were consulted, but also field staff, just to ensure that, that the standards and indicators that we were developing and contextualizing here were realistic. Uh, and of course, like eventually measured um, so after this, about two weeks of back and forth, we held a special workshop just for sections one through four of the standards, um, with an addition where we actually, you know, ironed out line by line indicators for each the thematic group of the standards. Um, sometimes taking out, sometimes putting in new ones, as long as uh, we were ensuring that they corresponded to the actual standard. Um, and then following this workshop, we had about another week of just, you know, to make sure everyone was, was on the same page, another week of feedback. Um, and then we went to a second workshop to specifically focus on section five regarding exit strategy and camp closure, uh, which, which here is a long ways down the road, unfortunately, as we said, camps are a measure of last resort, um, but it is a long way down the road realistically. And without a more concrete action plan in place, um, it's not it's not stopped. But we all basically agree um, that for now we have to wait on contextualizing those until we have a clearer picture from both um, higher levels of this humanitarian response and from the government of 
entangled as, as to uh, what agreements will be going forward in a more concrete fashion for the transition. But we will still be referring to that, that last section um, eventually um, to be, again, guiding the monitoring framework and, and guiding what we want to see in a successful transition um, of responsibilities of, of humanitarian side actors. I say humanitarian, the government is also humanitarian in this response. But you know, I mean, government, I mean, NGO, we um, to have that handover take place successfully. Um, so I'd say a key thing we've learned over this process quickly before I, I hand it over to questions to Dave is that uh, this, this being, uh, again, a fairly well developed camp management response. Some sections were run through very fast when we're going through indicator by indicator. Uh, there's things that you know, everyone, everyone has a, a good data sharing policy. Everyone um, you know, has good minimum standards for uh, site environment and site development. But uh, for example, here, a, a snag that we had to have a lot of discussion about was community representation. This is a very difficult, very political issue here. Um, but it's actually, it's actually immediately dovetailed into another um, I would call working group or initiative here called capacity sharing initiative, um, which is also part of that transition process um, or, or a, a group meant to help guide the transition process to government like camp management. Um, so our discussions over community representation actually helped guide some of the you know, discussions on the minimum standards, helped guide some of the discussions in the capacity sharing initiative. Um, regarding what we want to see, uh, you know, what we want to advocate for, as we acknowledge community representation is kind of a gap. And then several, you could say, um, political issues um, for why it is difficult to develop meaningful, formal community representation uh, structures for refugees here. Um, what we are working towards uh, in the spirit of community standards minimum qualities we'd want to see in those representation structures, even if they're not going to be identical across every agency, across every camp. It's just an example of, of one of the more challenging indicators that we, the challenging sets of indicators we have to work through uh, here. So with that said, I think I can open it up here. And let's go ahead. Maybe Travis, I have a question while we wait for, for a couple to come in. and. And one is that I, I think you just alluded to it in relationship to um, the relationship between the standards, how you were saying that representation was really kind of connected to capacity building and the capacity sharing initiative. And I'm wondering if your group, when you were discussing them, saw any other kind of linkages, because that was something Elena and I talked about quite a lot about with our training with ASB. So maybe if I can just put you on the spot about that, what were some of the other linkages that you saw between the standards? Sure. So actually, I have, I have our work right in front of me, so I can consult it for you. But um, so like I said, in that case, it linked to this thing called the capacity sharing initiative. However, other parts uh, of the standards, hold on, let's see, uh, other parts of the standards linked to, for example, a recent report that was done by the community, uh, communication and communities working group, um, of which uh, ident identified basically a lot of uh, complaints from the refugee community. Um, regarding regarding issues that would most directly link to the, the standardization of, of safety audits. Um, so, for example, standard 3.1 is that site residents and service providers live in a dignified environment that is safe and secure from harm and violence. Again, directly linked uh, to an action plan that we're developing uh, in response to this communication with communities. Report. So we began to see Basically, you could say uh, it's not cross sector linkages, but uh, cross working group linkages and, and linkages to other, other issues that we're talking about and forming groups of them. So, when we uh, get these reports from, from other actors who are you know, outside of the, the people working on minimum standards contextualization, we're noticing oh, well, this is an action, action point you know, for this separate issue that feeds into our ability to meet these minimum standards. There are things that would, that would come up as a gap when we were measuring ourselves in minimum 
standards, which are actually also being raised in other places. But again, this gives us kind of a universal, uh, more response-wide overview of those issues and allows us to, to create like action plans, specific action plans, operational action plans uh, to address some of those gaps that we've that we're doing. And, and maybe if I can just jump in. Hi, everyone, it's uh, Carrie. I think another thing that we were very conscious of during the workshop and uh, you know, as we're soliciting feedback and inputs and taking a lot of time from partners is that we didn't want to add on to partners already pretty heavy reporting burdens. We ask a lot of information from all of our partners every month, especially now that we have another restricted access situation with COVID. We've even increased the amount of information that we're soliciting from partners. So we were very conscious to um, to see where we were already reporting or where we were nearly reporting on some of the indicators so that in our service monitoring, for example, or in service mapping, facility monitoring, all the other kind of systems and reporting tools that our partners are already doing, where we could help to streamline or just slightly tweak certain, certain things we're already reporting on uh, to, to decrease the reporting burden as well. So finding the linkages is good in terms of looking at our overall response and our overall actions as a sector, but it's also really good to find those linkages to reduce so that to reduce the burden on partners so that this doesn't seem like kind of an added uh, an added thing that people have to do on top of everything else they have to do. So that that's something that we've really been conscious of is is finding those linkages to make the system more efficient over. Uh, maybe if I can just ask one question, I think in the chat, um, <clears throat> someone's mentioned um, the recent fire I, uh, that happened in Cox Bazaar in March. Um, I was wondering if you guys have been using the standards to inform any fire response or prevention strategies um, at a Cox Bazaar level. Thanks, Bruce. Um, yes, the fire has been on everyone's mind uh, since March and is still a major conversation and action uh, thing here, obviously. Um, a lot of the standards that we're looking at do look to reinforce and strengthen the emergency volunteers that all of the site management partners work with. Um, when it comes to fire specifically, like I said, that we have kind of another system for that. We have TORs for that. We are working on broader uh, pilot initiatives. So the fire fire response and standards for fire themselves are sort of a separate entity of this. However, the kind of umbrella standards for volunteers and for partners who will be overseeing that fire response and overseeing the volunteers who will do that are included in the minimum standards when we look at training for those volunteers, when we look at code of conduct for those volunteers, and when we look at uh, capacity building for those volunteers as well. So we don't necessarily go into individual emergencies or individual components of that response here, but we have uh, we have worked on minimum standards for those volunteers and for agencies' interactions with those volunteers as part of the minimum standards. Over. I just saw that Jen's put a comment in the text, which is probably why she was a little slow to get to the unmute. Well, I, I will say it now is, is that I, I think that's a really excellent example of contextualization is that and the interconnectedness, which I was just alluding to and you were talking about Travis, which is that you have already um, SOPs on that you already have volunteers on that you already have quite a lot of work done on that through different components of um, both representation of your community volunteers who are responsible for um, kind of first response. And that's integrated into um, both the safety and security part of it, which is standard 3.1, but it's also kind of coming up again with your contingency plans. And, and I really liked what you were saying, Carrie, about not wanting to create more reporting or more burdens on this. So I. Um, I, I wish we had more time to kind of um, 
interrogate, not interrogate you, to, to really draw upon your wisdom. And, and maybe we need to, Tom, like do a special webinar just with Cox Bazaar and to really kind of unpack all of the, the work that went into this workshop because we've had several requests from people from the field, um, you know, what was their agenda and how long did it take? And, you know, what were, who was invited? And there was, there's been so many questions kind of bilaterally to Tom and I about that. And so we do need to spend more time with it, but I think we need to move on to the next, to the next part. Um, so thank you, Carrie and, and Travis and Tom, I'll turn over to you and I'll, I'll be your slideshow promoter for the next important announcement. Yes. Um, so question to everyone is if you could have um, a month of um, support um, in order to implement the standards, um, is this something that you would be uh, in interested in? So we are asking any um, country operation if they could write um, a short email asking or, or, or telling us how they would use a dedicated expert for uh, program support or implementation of the standards. Um, and then uh, essentially the, 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 the best one will win that uh, support. This is not theoretical. This is very much grounded in reality that there is um, this support available. Um, we won't tell you who that dedicated expert is, but I don't think it's very difficult to um, to guess. So yes, we're asking for um, uh, by Wednesday. It doesn't have to be um, a short novel. I mean, it 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 can just be a few points on um, how you would use it and and maybe sort of why you feel that 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 it would help. So yes. Um, yeah, um, send them away. We will review them. We will pick the winner. Um, and um, then that support will be available. And I guess just to say that um, if we have a lot of demand, then we can right away and say that there is there's a huge need for this, that there's a huge need for contextualization and support. And we can um, develop our concept note to send out to make sure that we can get um, more dedicated support, but we have we have one on offer, and we will announce this. Charlie, please give us five minutes for our important announcement on Friday, please. So you have five minutes. It's it's a real life win a prize, take it away announcement. So you definitely have five minutes. Thank you. Um, the very last thing to to share with everybody before we close up for today is to invite you to the official launch. So this has been the launch for camp managers. This has been the launch for the people. The, um, as Tom calls it, the ivory tower launch will be taking place on the 15th of July at five, at five o'clock, at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, that's Geneva time. And we are giving you a sneak peek of the cover of the handbook. Tristan was holding up handbook covers. You can see our handbook cover here. And we really hope that you will take time out of your busy schedules to come back on the 15th of July. It's gonna be hard to top Phil, but we do have some important speakers lined up and Phil, we may ask you to come back and to do a repeat. Uh, but thank you for marking your calendars already. And if you haven't had a chance to download the minimum standards yet, you can do so for a few more short days before our um, online version is ready. And with that, we'll turn back over to you, Charlie. Thank you so much. What exciting news. So not only are the minimum standards pre-launched, because you just all saw it here, the, the launch is happening on the 15th of July, and there is a prize up for grabs to win one month of resources of someone's time. Who would turn that down? Who knows who that person could be, but they could be helping you. Yes, you in your office or a distance. 
but helping you very soon. So, so pay attention to that. Get in your response to Jen and the team. Um, thanks, Eleanor, for that fantastic emoji response. That's what we need. Um, it, I know it feels like it's, it, it may feel like it's been a bit of a long session, but it's been a really full session. So I just want to, I want to just remind you what we've done today and tell you what we're going to do tomorrow. Um, and I want to say thank you to a few people. So um, in terms of what we've done today, we've looked at these two massive topics, things about going forwards, think about shaping CCCM in the future. So the global cluster strategy, and I want to pay a huge thanks uh, to, to both Dare and to Juan for their contributions there, and to all of you for feeding into that and helping us to understand what you think of that and, and how that's working for you. And then on the CCCM minimum standards, I mean, what a huge step forward, an incredible, incredible talk from, from Phil, and then hearing from Tristan how this relates to all the other standards and seeing us becoming part of this global family of standards. And then from Travis and Kerry to, to understand that, what that actually means in, in real terms on the ground. And then thanks to Bruce and Jennifer and Tom for a fantastic session there. Um, tomorrow we will be asking, I think, a really fundamental question, which is how people-centered is our work? How focused is your work on the people that matter, the people that are affected by disaster? And we'll be looking at that through two lenses. One is about how you measure participation, and the other is about how you undertake needs assessment and analysis, and do that in a way that really helps you to understand the needs of affected people. So come back for that at the same time tomorrow.